myself and I introduce myself. Um, and with your introductions, we can move along. One of the things I hated me is spending an hour in the meeting was just trying to get each other by story. So we can just say hello to each other and we don't have to add a whole lot unless you just feel the need to. So, Laura, you can go first. Uh, I'm Laura Meisner. I'm uh, with the Polish Advocating for Animals, and I've been doing TNR for about 10 years. And in the last few years, I've been trapped and done TNR for over 600 cats in the same office. Thanks, Wes. I'm a member of CAFA also. Uh, Karen Krauss, the director of the Feral Cat Coach in Oregon. Randy Mills, I'm a volunteer here, but I think I'm just saying. Dee Dee Swan, I'm a Salem Prince of Elon's. I'm Emily Fuller, I'm on the TNR Committee of the Vanessa Warner from San Francisco Lines on the TNR. Ron Murray from San Francisco Lines on the TNR. Helen Rossa, volunteer in terms of the TNR. Edith Walters, I just want to do it on my own. I'm sorry. I'm Susan Carey, I work here at the Life Committee. We have a living out of Paul Hank, I'm a volunteer as well. I'm a volunteer as well. I'm a volunteer as well. John Whalen, I'm a county animal shelter. We're at Newport. I'm a shelter manager here. I'm Alice Barr, I'm a foster and investment coordinator here. Dr. Jack Carter, I'm a veterinarian here. BJ Anderson, I'm the volunteer manager here. I'm Tracy Crandall, and I'm a volunteer here at WHS. Meredith School, Development Assistant. Thank you. Lynn Christensen, Finance Director here at the shelter. Great example, um, interesting person. It's always good at these meetings to have one regular person. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Jay Levitri, Communications Manager at Willamette Humane. I'm Shannon Graves, Concerned Citizen. Okay. Cat Lady. Kevin Graves, I'm her son. Concerned Citizen. Michelle Blake, Oregon State Council of the Humane Society of the United States. Okay. Was that everybody? And so, anybody that didn't get a big name tag that I can read, um, that's okay, I just won't be. Um, if you would rather have the name tag, then I would like to you. My name is Dorinda Pulliam, and um, I'm new to the Pacific Northwest. I uh, recently retired from the city of Austin in Austin, Texas, um, and um, was tired of heat, so I moved up here <laughs> once I left. Um, I, in the city of Austin, I was um, an executive. Uh, what I did was a troubleshooter, and I went to departments that weren't doing very well and I felt a little better. And my last uh, department that I had before I left was our animal shelter house on our um, open intake, publicly owned and operated animal shelter also now, some of those works. Um, and I've been doing some work um, with the bin, so stay in theater group, um, we have part of them. And um, doing some work with them. Some folks from Salem went over the mountains and heard me talking about bear cats up there and asked me if I go back to this set of mountains and help them talk about cats a little bit. Um, one of the things that we did in Austin is I was really crazed about prevention programs. Um, I felt like our shelters throughout the United States were really on the treadmill of animals coming in the door and trying to get them out the door one way or the other. And it seemed to me that um, a better approach would be to stop the treadmill or slow it down. So my first five or seven years at the animal shelter in Austin we focused um, primarily on prevention programs. So we started a free sterilization program for our low-income families. Uh, we started um, a TNR, free TNR program. Uh, we worked with our um, not other partner nonprofits to amp up our affordable or low cost and neutering. And then we also made sure that 100% of the animals leaving our rescue groups and our um, shelters in the Austin area, that 100% of those animals were leaving the shelter intact. 
man. I mean, not so good. <laughs> so, um, so I have some experience with um, these programs, and I'm really proud of what we did. So I feel like I have um, some things that I can share with you, and some things that I can do to help you have a discussion about what's happening in this community and how you can um, move forward and do some really positive things for cats. Our um, program, and also I'll tell you just to give you a sense, we started with uh, 300 cats the first year we did um, our routine our program. And that program today does about 3,000 animals a year, 3,500. Um, so we started with little baby steps, and from those little baby steps came a really exciting program that really has made a huge difference. Um, as kind of a final thought, um, the last half of my time at the shelter, we started focusing on handing up our placement program. So when I went to that shelter, we started, we had a euthanasia rate of 7%. And the day I left, we had a euthanasia rate of 10%. And I've been gone about two years now, and they're still maintaining the euthanasia rate of 10%, which is considered a um, kill these days in the industry. Um, so I tell you that, not to brag, although it's fun, um, but I tell you that. I think that it proves that prevention programs get communities where they need to be if their goal is to be more humane um, with the animals in the community. It really does work. We never could have done that with placement alone, ever. Uh, because the treadmill was just going faster and faster. There's no amount of placement that we could have done. It. So, um, and we have proof out in some of these communities that start small, you can build bigger things, and they really will have. Any questions about that? Is that thirty-five hundred a year now fairly stable from yes. this year? Yes, it is, and it was built. Um, the way we got that program is we did the three hundred cats as a demonstration program because we wanted the ASPCA to give us a bulk of money, and I knew that if we proved to them we could do it right, that they would. I was hoping they would. And so the 300 cats that we did the year in year one, our pilot project, were targeted to specific um, colonies that were getting any kittens. So they weren't just 300 random cats. They were 300 cats that were giving us kittens. And we knew that. We knew these cats. And so those are the ones that we sterilized that first year. And just those 300 cats that first year, we reduced our kitten intake significantly. And so we reduced our euthanasia rate for cats significantly. So then we had statistics to get into the ASPCA because that gives a bunch of money. And they did. And then from that, um, they gave us a bunch of money, and but we committed that we would be weaned off of that, I think, in three years. I uh, thought it was either two or three years. And the, we ended up housing the feral cat program at our Humane Society because our shelter didn't have the sterilization space and our other two nonprofits that did low cost sterilization, their, their surgery suites weren't big enough. And we had uh, Texas a and run so, um, their training program at our Humane Society. And also. So anyway, we did it there. And they committed that they would amp up the fundraising to replace the ASPCA money as it went away. And so it's totally sustainable now. It's probably been running five years now. Um, and that is, you know, uh, uh, that was a really strong strategic approach is prove you could do something good and then get somebody to give you a bunch of money and then commit that they don't have to give it to you forever. Um, it's a really good strategy for both of us. Other questions about who I am or what I said or anything before we get started? So the town that you were, the shelter was serving, that you did the three-year cats, what was the, the size of the population, the size of the town? Uh, Austin's probably a million, too, and our shelter intake was $20,000 a year. So it was big. We had big problems. We both were both of the town. We got an overwhelming in But that's why I thought that the prevention programs were so important. Um, and I can draw you a graphic, but I don't have any pieces of paper, I don't know what it is. But our intake per capita took a sharp drop down as our population was going up. Um, and our actual intake has stayed flat on seven years. So as our population increased, our human population increased, our 
increase tenfold. Um, our actual intake stay level is still 20,000 animals a year, and the per capita intake is a huge drop. Yes, sir? Do I understand correctly that uh, all of your feral cat intake, you're adopting on the most of them? Our total, our live release rate is, ten, is um, our youth, our youth initial rate is 10%, our live release rate is 90%. Of, of the, all species, dogs, cats, a few roosters, pig every once in a while. What the cats you took in, the feral cats you took in, what, what proportions were not without released to long youth release? Well, this is a good time to have my discussion about feral. <laughs> Uh, one of the first things I did at the shelter is we stopped labeling cats feral because they're not their cats. And how they came there, and typically how shelters do it, is if they come to track, they decide they're feral. So we just said they're cats. And if they're nice cats, they could go to the homes. And if they were not nice cats, then we had to come up with another solution. So we did not track that statistic. Um, our placement of feral cats because um, an interesting thing I thought at the time is that I didn't come from this industry. I came from the industry of making things work better. So I would ask a lot of questions that would aggravate the people that were from the industry. <laughs> so I would say, well, what's feral cat? And they would say a bunch of stuff that didn't explain what a feral cat was. So we did away with that. I tell you, when we started uh, the TNR program, one of the things that really hit me too as a person that was coming new to the shelter to try to figure out what's going on is that once we got the youth measure down from 70% to 50%, the dog euthanasia rate was only 30%, but the cat euthanasia rate was 70%. And that's typical in shelters. Um, they're very dog centric, typically, and I'm not um, saying anything about the shelter, but they tend to be dog centric. Um, so I was decided somebody needs to be paying attention to this, and so for like the next three years, all we breathed was cats, and all we talked about was cats, and that's where we got to the TNR program, which did make less cats come into the shelter, and there the euthanasia rate just plummeted for those guys. And the other thing that I would talk about with the euthanasia rate with cats is that. You know, we could place a zillion kittens, and we would have a zillion kittens coming into the shelter. But while we're placing a zillion kittens, and by what I mean by placement is that we're doing the sterilization surgery and the vaccinations and the microchips and all the resources it takes for an animal to get adopted. Well, we're doing a zillion kittens; they're all having happy lives. We have less than a zillion adults that we don't have the resources for. So we knew that if we were going to make a big dent in having our adult population have a better outcome, we need to have much less than a zillion kids, even though much happens to come from kids. Yes, sir? Um, just so I'm clear, I know like, it's the focus of the discussion tonight is on feral cats, but in, in general, the, the success you were citing with the thing, was it primarily due to the control of feral cats, or was it a combination of that with just general community acceptance of having your pets uh, sterilized? Well, certainly both. I mean, we were pushing on that. I mean, no animals were leaving our shelters intact, which was a big change, because there had been such a focus on getting them out of the shelter, we there wasn't a focus on getting them out of the shelter without cars. So there was that, and we did have our partners providing affordable sterilization. So we were working on the owned population of animals, getting them those sterilized. But, you know, we had a, a lot of statistics in our shelter about where animals came from. And a zillion kittens come from, from free-roaming cats. And so that's where we were getting our kittens from. And so our TNR program made a huge difference in our intake because it got to that issue of free roaming cats that left off, you know, the free roaming cat lays its babies in the nest and it goes hunting and the Good Samaritan finds the babies and now they're my babies in the shelter and the mother's still out there hunting. And so we really wanted to stop that cycle. I, th I think you have to have both of them. You've got to get the cats in homes. Yes, sir? Um, 
can be fixed so that they don't contribute to the population of cats that are out and running around. Is it? What was low cost? What what they have to qualify by income? Or? We did not. Okay. In our free program, we didn't. So the free program was targeted, was provided in low income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to worry. Rich people weren't going to go over to Forsyth Town to get a free surgery. That doesn't really happen. And so I just provided those surgeries in the poor part of town, and then I didn't have to worry about rules and administrative food law. I just said, Joel, we're going to get it done. And that's where the poor people would have got it done. Okay. And then part of Pardon? That some of South Uh, Not really. In Austin, that particular city, there's a big dividing line between people with money and people without. It's also a big dividing line between people of color and, and, and the black population. And so there are only two veterinary clinics on the east side of town for so four people and people of color. But I think we'll like to help out, but there's just two clinics in the But then we also have two nonprofit clinics who provide the word that I use as affordable spend here because low cost is a misnomer. Low cost means it didn't cost that much to do it. And it does cost a lot of nonprofits to subsidize that donation. So and the affordable clinics I don't remember any of their rates were running, but probably in the $50, $60 range. And they, neither one of those clinics did, tar, did uh, uh, income qualifying, but both of those were located on the east side of town as well, where we have the majority population of working clubs. Yes, ma'am? How do you get the word out to those groups that folks that were low income that were offering these group services? Um, the way we did that is utilize the public, um, public, the public health, the public service safety net. So in every community, um, city and county, they provide free stuff to poor people that need help. They provide um, the WIC program, the Women and Infant Children program, probably part of that. There's food stamps, there's free immunizations, free vaccinations. Is. Every community is doing a bunch of free stuff for people who need help. We have um, disability programs, and low income programs. Well, all people go to places to get that stuff. They go to a place to get their free clothes or food or whatever. And so those people that run those programs became my best friends. And they would give my information about sterilization to their clients. So Meals on Wheels took our flyers out to all their clients. Habitat for Humanity skewed our flyers to all their clients. Everybody that was doing free stuff for poor people eventually became our best friends. And they got for our services. Gladly. I mean, they saw it as part of the solution to the problems in those communities. Um, and we also we used the police department. We used the garbage department. Um, anybody that was going out to touch those neighborhoods, we had them include our information. And that's how we did it. Costs nothing, and it was amazing. Can I ask another piece of that? Did you sure. have an outreach team that went and with all these different agencies? Um, eventually we did, and that was like eight years later. I think like the last two years before I left, I finally got budgeted for an outreach coordinator. But a lot of that, um, because I was a person in the city who fixed other departments. I knew a lot of the department's heads <laughs> and I just asked them to help me. So what, what that says is networking. Networking. And networking out of the animal world. When I started doing it, people thought I was crazy. They're like, oh, why, why are you call the garbage department? Well, the garbage department goes to that neighborhood where pit bulls are chained up, and they know about those dogs, and they can tell me where they are, and they can go help them. So networking to this public health, public service, um, entities in the community is really a key for reaching um, your low-income populations because they're already doing it and they will help you for free because they want to help those families. Just Did you provide the flyers to them or mm -hmm. cards? Yep, just plain old pieces of paper. <laughs> well, and you know what we like about the time of that, we had Facebook and all that, but really the population we were trying to reach Plain old pieces of paper was good. And they were used to go to places that had posters and plain old pieces of paper to 
to get a flyer about where they could get free immunizations. Like here in this community, um, your public health department or somebody is giving free shots to kids, to poor kids. And if those people giving shots to poor kids, we would tell those kids to take them a piece of paper about where to get free shots from their animals to give a free sterilization if you start going on. Question, so, and I think that's a great idea that you're targeting the neighborhood specifically like that, but did you bring the services to them, like with a mobile veterinary van, with or free then the trouble is getting them to come to you, right, if they don't have transportation or something? Well, we had a free clinic that we did um, park in, at those clinics, at those public health clinics, at those neighborhood centers. We parked, we had a free, that's when we did our free program, because it was a van and it went to the community that's center. Right. Uh, but our two nonprofits who provided affordable still targeted to the same populations. They were stationary clinics. And, uh, I, you know, I don't want to get too far off from talking about your community. But basically, what we did is kind of use the spiral effect where we said, let's start with the people that can go. And we got all those people attached to these clinics where they knew where they were. And then the word spread and pretty soon. That was the clinic for these poor neighborhoods. The low the two low cost clinics as well as the free clinic. And then as time went on, we said, okay, now we're getting to the harder to serve population. And so we need some specialty programs. And so eventually we started up a van program where we would go into the really hard to serve neighborhoods, where people are living in shacks literally. And we would pick up those animals and bring them. We've got a great webinar that was done by one of my colleagues um, that ran one of the, the sterilization clinics uh, that talks about exactly this, targeting and the different levels of customer, of clients and people that have animals. And you, know, you can start on the outer edge and it's a little easier to get to them. And as you work in, it's going to be harder to reach them. Those programs will become more expensive and more time intensive, but out here it can be pieces of paper given away, and over here it might have to be a van with delivery service or something like that. If you're interested in seeing that webinar, I think it's only an hour, and it is a wonderful thing to capture exactly the issue of how do you get spay either services delivered to the people that need it. And until our seven years of experience in the field of doing this and boiled it down to an hour discussion about targeting services. Um, so if you'd like to see it, if you just let me know, I'll send you a link to it. Um, but somebody will have to send me an email. So I they send me an email to you. It's, it's really worth seeing you guys. Okay, so that's about me. That's about the stuff I know, which is fun that you're interested in it. What I thought we would do tonight is talk a little bit about where uh, Salem is. And is Salem how we're defining the area that we care about? And by care, I just mean the <coughs> area of concern is Salem? Or is it Mary County? Polk County. Polk County. Mary Polk County. Yeah. Okay. So what I thought we would do is um, talk about where you are, what are the problems that you're experiencing, and then talk about possible solutions. In the middle of that, though, I'd like to talk about how do we evaluate possible solutions? Because there's a zillion really good uh, solutions, and you all know them, and you can start spitting them out of them. And what the challenge I see, and what we're trying to accomplish as people who care about these animals, is well, we, we spend a lot of time talking about arguing talking about what the right solution is, and we don't get as much forward movement as we could because we don't have consensus about how to decide what is the good solution. And, and I'll give you an example. I had um, a person who was really surprised me, the National Audit Society, come to Austin and tell me that he was willing, because of the problems we were making, he was willing to build a shelter for cats. I would agree to stop TMR and just Sterilizing sterilize them the shelter. And he, so, but, you know, how many people in this room would raise their hands? That's a great idea. Let's get the other one to build us a big shelter. So, after several hours, I convinced him that it would be filled up in about 30 minutes, and then we'd keep on this another one. 
<laughs> started doing Anchorage calculations for them and how long that would last. So we can have a lot of good solutions, but I think it's important to have some criteria for how we're going to evaluate them, and that kind of helps us as a community stay focused on the solutions that are the most implementable, the most doable, and can get on with it, and the things that are the least doable, they can wait to talk here and have the resources or whatever. So does that sound like a discussion that you're interested in having? Okay, because I want it to be useful to, to y'all, whatever comes out of this, I want it to be useful to you. Um, so if it sounds good, then what I'd like to start with, and we'll spend less time on this and more time on solutions, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the answer to the question, do you have a feral cat problem? Say, or in this country, or a free roaming cat problem? Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about <coughs> what is the problem. How are we defining it as a problem? How do we know we have a problem? Because, because our save rate is not 10%. And I'm under pressure. It's not 80%. Yeah, so let's have, how do we know we have to be cats? We, we see it. For a friend that Eli speaks, as many in the summer as I'd say as many as 50 calls a day and we just can't take it I mean we, so, there's so many coming at us that we can't possibly so meet that need. We would define too many cats as too much intake into the shelters. Yeah, it's beyond the capacity. Not 
saying that they see them around their office, their apartment complex, their, you know, their country home, whatever. So that to me seems to happen a lot. Do you hear um, 
And we didn't get anybody from the city or county here, do we? No. Um, do, do you hear complaints from the Apartment Management Association or Apartment Health Office? Here we go. Yes. Oh, yes. Yep. We've gotten in trouble for TNR because we've had residents who's had, who's had bleeding hearts and we bring cats back and then I was involved in a situation where they were being poisoned and someone was dead in the feeding station. And I was asked to give that cat because it was upset. In, in Austin, every apartment complex had a, a cat home. And, and I asked that one specifically because this is a really easy thing to tackle because you can go to an apartment complex and there they are. And so you can get on top of it real quickly if you can give them the money to. I did. I invited them to a meeting like this. And in three hours, they walked out with every two months. We don't have that. We don't have that here. Yeah, but we like to get on our solution list. Because maybe we need to get them invited and do some talking with them and get them to see one TNR solution for their it, complaints. And the complaint is, is um, they use the bark dust as a litter box when sure. the tenants open their window. It smells and bed. It doesn't just maintain the few that you've done. Just don't stay the few. Other cats come in. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a problem. Yeah. It's, but there are solutions to it. Yes, sir? Good night. I don't have much background, but I'd like to hear some other comments. I know, like, for example, the two comments that we're concerned about is very agricultural. You have, you know, farming. And so my, what I wonder about a barrier in, like, this, this program is, like, if, are there a lot of farmers who, in a sense, they have their barn cats and they could care less about controlling them? Just that, I mean, in other words, you could say, hey, we'll do this all for free. They don't, they don't want to hear that. They, their, their, their attitude is, let, let them go. Well, let me ask you this. Sometimes. Do, do you have, do you have cat problems in your rural areas? Typically you don't because coyotes eat them. Uh, that's, so, true. That's, so, that's true on my, I live on a 200 acre ridge mm -hmm. and the neighbor had a cat population explosion and they disappeared and it wasn't okay. because she took them Spare. all to the shelter. And, I've had, and I've had a couple of farm placements because yeah. farm placements are just coyotes. Kind of yeah, our feral cats don't stay. Yeah. So typically you don't have them. So if you're hearing something specific from your rural areas, that's a real specific thing that we would want to explore. Um, because typically the natural predators that are out there, the hawks and coyotes, owls, 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 and owls eat those cats. As soon as you didn't have trees, I mean, I think the trees protect our cats. And they, I mean, that's the cats go, oh, if the cats, I have a 12 year old who did, I lost four cats within six months at my house from my lease. I have a 21 year old that roamed, and I know she was just on two. We got a tree case in the yeah. community, so. You know, well, I looked at Turner, and that's when I started doing with TNR, the population of people is 1,900, and the population of ferrets is at least 600. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. My husband was a police officer, would drive around at night, and the cats would be jumping in and out of the garbage. So, yeah, but that in the urbanized part of that, even if it's only 1900, where are those cats going? Okay. They're actually in the town. We have uh, yeah. two mills, and in those mills, yeah. the cats are. It's yeah, so that's a different thing. Yeah. Then if, if somebody yeah. has a ranch, 200 acres, mm -hmm. the, the coyotes are going to eat those cats. We will be amazed. We, and I, I don't, I don't mean to be offend, offend anybody, but I've seen feral cats on our property have litters, and those litters are picked off. Um, so they may be reproducing, but the litters are not surviving. And so I, before I can even trap them and bring them in, um, they're gone. And that's on that's in a big natural area, and they just fit into the not very well into the ecosystem there. Yeah, okay. But but they're small. A small town, did, and that's a real specific thing with the female. That's real specific. Um, yeah, so the thing that's there is food that is making the cats come and get them. Um, okay. I don't know how we're going to do this. Um, other problems? Yes. Well, just to give a little perspective, I've just gone to a wonderful fundraiser hosted by the Land Humane Society. Thank you. And there are staff here who probably can cite the source. 
At that fundraiser, we account for the number of unclaimed free roaming cats in the greater Salem area, which is Polk and, uh, and Marion County, our two counties, 70,000. There are 90,000 cats, they estimate, that are cows that are, that are owned. owned and live outside. We're a community, Salem on Wikipedia, is just under 160,000 people. So there's 160,000 humans in this community. Our two counties is pushing 400,000. Mm -hmm. I don't even fathom what you do with 70,000 free roaming cats. But they're out there. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Because you can find all the barns and all the homes and all the wonderful things to say to friends and others do. Yeah. Well, I'm trying not to jump to the conclusion because I do want us to kind of talk through some possible solutions. But um, population control, I really don't know really deal with it. Just population control. Yes, sir? It seems like the it's not being mentioned here, but we're, we're concerned about kitties. I've had kitties for 60 years. But, you know, if you look at, at the uh, estimates that are coming out, the number of birds and small mammals and, and reptiles that are eaten by free roaming cats is immense. So I, I think it doubles the notion that we have a cat problem. It's not just a problem of too many cats in all of these kinds of, or from all of these kinds of indicators. But with 70,000 free roaming cats out here, native bird population and small mammal populations and whatnot, I think that's, that's a really good reason to do something that's very effective that gets humane cats and also gets at the problem of the ecological impact. But, and that's what I was going to ask next is, is um, there should be some concern about the environmental um, yeah. predation of wildlife and the environment, the balancing of the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, you know, on that comment, I just want to share this. Uh, uh, a couple years back, we visited my sister-in-law in Winnipeg, and they have some very tough regulations. For example, you can't own a pit bull. This, this is still legal. You can't have a pit bull. Cats are not allowed to roam. You have to keep your cats in the house. And pardon my French, but basically they're up to their ass and rabbits. Don't. A lot of rabbits. And my my uh, sister-in-law has seen, for example, too, they have a lot of crows. I don't know what crows do to the other birds, but she's actually seen crows attack the rabbits, at least as part of the control. So my point is, as good intention you are, you start trying to mess sometimes with uh, basically the chain of being or the, the, the biological control controls. And you push down one, on one thing and then another problem. Pops up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, we should be concerned about the impact that we humans are having by what we're allowing to happen Yeah, one of the things I was going to say, though, uh, is uh, that comes from uh, the East Coast, where I lived in a county that did, again, allow free roaming of cats. But, uh, and, and when we say free roaming, it also includes only roaming. Oh. And, uh, and, and the thing is, what I found uh, here uh, when I moved here is people here have a very different attitude. So I, I think um, you know, the point is, is a lot of these cats that are roaming around are owned cats, mm -hmm. so they're just not kept indoors. Doesn't mean that all these cats are going around and uh, you know killing birds or lizards or whatever are actually most of them, like a lot of them are owned cats. So they're you know it's it's to, to try to get so you know this uh, you know sociologically this this group of people that keep cats indoors would be uh, I think a much bigger yeah, I, I got that one on the list, free roaming own cats. And again, I, I'll, I'll press you guys throughout the night on the, not just the vocabulary, but the thinking about feral versus owned. It really doesn't matter. They're just cats, and they're cats that, unless we know they're sterilized, are making more cats. And so it doesn't really matter what 
their status is in the universe. And th that I'm, I'm making that point, but when you start talking about specific solutions, you get into some real nitty gritty that that philosophy starts to matter. Like one of the questions we had in our TNR program was, when are we going to hear to 100% of the cats? And I said, yes. And then other people said, ooh, what if they're all? And I said, well, they should have already been sterilized and <laughs> inside somebody's house and they wouldn't have to take care of <laughs> um, So we did sterilize 100% of them. And it, it's one of the ways that you keep people from sneaking owned cats into a free TNR program because you want it to be targeted to the cat you're trying to target. But uh, we did get a few complaints from people who ended up with their beautiful Siamese cat having fun here. Um, but we also started making a culture change in our community um, with the idea that they're free roam and they're, they're in the public space or they're in my yard and that's your bad. <laughs> if it loses a tooth that's here, that's a minor price to pay. It could have been run over by a car, eaten by a coyote, stolen by a hawk. So anyway, I'm going to press you on those words. Okay, any other problems we have to talk about? Did you see any increase in identification on your indoor-outdoor cats? <laughs> oh, after that? Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the same time, one of the preven other prevention programs that we, did, that we had going, that I didn't talk about because it wasn't sterilization related, is we had a microchip program you wouldn't believe. I mean, we were microchipping about 20,000 animals a year, and um, we did a tagging program as well where we were pushing zillions of free tags out into the community. So our reclaim rate for cats was going up at the same time that our intake was coming down and we were pushing um, identification. Okay, any other problems that we haven't talked about? Yes, sir? Uh, intact tongs attacking all the animals. In that Comcast, males that have not been castrated have a much higher level of aggression than a lot of times they'll attack the animals, especially the cats. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, ma'am. May I suggest that we kind of mix the groups here in the little group? So WHS is in a whole group, but instead of that simple kind of group. Well, I think you'd get more agreement on dots if you kept the group, the small groups. If you, and I'll tell like you, minded. if you do the dot thing, if you will just agree to go quickly, put your dots on and come back to your seat. It will cause some chaos. But that's okay with me, as long as we do our chaos quickly. I think we can do it. So can you do your chaos quickly? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you got a zillion dollars, that's great. But if you don't have a zillion dollars, 
that's not going to be a real solution. So it needs to be cost effective. What's your other big ticket things it has to be? Program in Jacksonville, 
And something that disturbed me reading about that was how they kept talking about how they kind of, when people brought cats to the shelter, they didn't tell them that this was a possibility. And it seemed like they were kind of covering up what they were doing because they didn't want to get engaged in a conversation with people bringing in the animals. Um, transparency? Yeah, transparency. Um, being ethical. Ethical. <laughs> I have a big problem with uh, hiding what you're doing. Yes, okay. In order to have the confrontation. I have that one. I think that's a really good one. But I don't want to get too many of these because the bottom line is when you, when humans, not you personally, but when humans evaluate things, they only use three. I've done a study on it. <laughs> something that, uh, and I don't know how to put it, but with a quick return, something that starts working immediately. Um, would that fall under that measurable, measurable results? Maybe? I think I'm going to put that under cost effective. Cost effective. Well, I'm going to add one more, but really, you won't get some effective. I'll put it next Produces desirable results. <laughs> that is sort of related to measurable. Yes. You know, in the animal shelter, we uh, they have a little rating system of one to seven to rate adoptability, and don't doesn't matter how it all works. But we had a scale of one to seven. Nobody ever used more than three numbers. Like my numbers, I used were five, six, and seven, and somebody else used. Four, five, and six. But we only ever used three numbers. Hmm. And then we all got to know each other's numbers, like your four was the equivalent of my five. <laughs> and so but it did the job with the communication system. So I can write <laughs> these down. But when I tell you, all right, when we talk about solutions, I want you to evaluate each solution based on these, you're only gonna use three. Okay. Um okay. So can we say that as we talk about solutions? to use this for context of what, what makes a good idea. I'm going to use the color yellow, we're going to call purple, and the color red. We read these things represent what we think is a good idea. Alright? Okay. Can I give a suggestion? Yes. Uh, if we took the humane part out and just made that our umbrella, because we're not going to ever accept anything something that is humane, I think we could strike that one because it's just going to be a given. A given. Yeah, a given. Yeah. Is everybody okay with that? No. It's a given. It's a given. No, it's going to look good. We don't care. care. Intake is too high. 
whether these cats are going to your euthanasia, your shelter that, that's required in the euthanasia, or your shelter that's limited in take that doesn't do euthanasia, or your rescue group that doesn't do euthanasia, or your rescue group that does do euthanasia. Isn't it true that just it takes too high? high. Yes. So let's change that one and say intake is too high. And you are right, they are related, but I talk to lots and lots of animal welfare folks, and I can tell you, after many years of doing it, we'd love to talk about euthanasia. A lot of them would love to talk about intake. And so it's important to keep them separate so people really want to talk about euthanasia, you can do it. You can talk about intake, you can do it. Okay, where was I? Yes. I was just going to say that those two things are caused by the too many requests for help. I mean, the fact that there's so many animals in the community that need help are what causes the other two to happen. Well, I'll disagree with you a little bit. Okay. Those two things are caused because there's too many cats. Well, yeah. I mean, that's not <laughs> why right. there's too many cats, right? What's this you talking about? Too many cats. That's the only one that's not caused by too many cats. <laughs> that is the cause. That's the cause. That's the cause. So all those things are caused by that. Right. Right. Yes, ma'am. So the lack of education should be the number one thing. Yeah, get it involved. Yeah. 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 Because you would get your intake down and your too many requests for help, and you can tell people this is what you want to go after and you can do. Because there's a lot out there, and I have helped a lot of people without having to leave my home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So let's start to talk about um, uh, solutions. And there's about 50,000 of them. And I'm not going to just talk about 50,000 because then we have to 8.30 and we're only going to implement three of them because humans do everything with three. <laughs> so we do want to get to the big ticket things. We do want to get to the things that we can go out and do. And, and I don't mean to diminish the small ticket things because they all make a difference. But um, so I'm just warning you, I'm not going to let us brainstorm solutions for two hours. And the for a little more. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're focusing on just those five, not all the other things, just our top five that we did. So what do we envision as solutions? Yes, on the education, we have to. Um, I don't know if you can do a video, but maybe flyers to uh, manufacture home parks, to uh, uh, apartment complexes, uh, to any neighborhoods that have, uh, I don't know what they call it, basically. I don't know how you get to the neighborhoods for that. Okay, so we target information campaigns to problem areas. Yes? Can I add to target information to? Problem areas and leadership there, or is that another one? Oh, well, not just to the people who live there, but to someone who could actually take yeah. action there. Like, we're not going to reach eighty thousand people. Well, I think that's a methodology. That's part of how. That's part of the target. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the methodology for doing this. Um, I'll, I'll write that down so you don't forget it. But. Yeah, you're not going to go out and talk to every one of these people. You're going to get those garbage men and all those people on board. And I was telling you about get them to do it for you. Is it, shouldn't um, those informational materials be bilingual, at least for our community? That's part of the strategy. Is that part? Okay. So yeah. I, 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 that, that, that's a whole other night, I think. Okay. Yep, you're right. Mm -hmm. that's, okay. Other ideas for solutions? I think you pointed out in your area that networking was a major factor of your success. And so engaging municipalities and just networking with other agencies. You know, the, the fact that we don't have any city representatives or county representatives here tonight is, yeah. is an indication that yeah. there's a gap that needs to be filled. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Collaboration. Ooh, I love that. I can't 
short way to say this is from here. Do you guys have like an official collaboration here in this community? Maybe one. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Um getting this much because I love them. Mm -hmm. Have a pretty good night. Uh, if we build a strong collaboration, then we may be able to get some of the big boys like the ASPCA to get some money or something. Money. Yeah, money comes from that, right? Yep. You can't get money, well, but collaboration is such a big thing now um, in GM welfare and big nonprofits. They want to see collaborative proposals. If you put collaboration in it, my little band group, they're getting grants right now. Well. Could we start a little baby collaboration? Okay, and what's happening with your TNR program here? So you have one? And we're happy about that? I just need to write down anything about that. Is it needed things? Aren't we going to have to do more? It needs invigoration. Needs what? Invigoration. They know some good <laughs> words. <laughs> we, we have a key in our community. We have Carol Cackbush, we have individuals, we have Salem Friends of Feelings. We have a lot of, in, of groups and individuals working on TNR, but it's not enough yet because of what they've set up there of resources and, and right. people to, and to is do your the work. TNR, I'm sorry. Is your TNR targeted right now? We got a grant in the PetSmart Charities, a two-year grant, to target the 97305 zip code area. And we used that up last July. And that was on their criteria that they wanted us to target a specific yeah. zip code area. Well, that's why I asked the question is that they're, they're going to be asking that because that's how you make the numbers make sense. You can yeah. do a thousand surgeries, but if you aren't doing the right thousand surgeries, you're not going to impact this. Can I get my thing going? You're not going to impact your shelter intake. So I would say that something on part of that solution, or maybe a, a method, is going to be um, understanding where the kittens are coming from. Figure it out. Understand, identify where the kittens are coming from. Do you guys need this to hear me? You know, it doesn't seem to be working much anyway. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, ma'am? I just have a comment. The, uh, for the TNR, pro TN TNR program, I think in Salem, the community, just what I've observed, much to my dismay, of course, is that most people would like to see the R part go away. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, don't bring them back to our neighborhood. That's what yeah. 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 And that's what I see. I mean, we, I have trapped and neutered poodles of animals in our neighborhood and stuff. But really what people want to see is it disappear. They, they don't want them in the neighborhood. Um, so getting the community behind that. So is, is that a big issue? The problem that we need to capture is the return part of TNR? Yeah. I, I think community I education is really lacking in that area. Well, the solutions to the return part are not just education. Well, and what there, are, there are other strategies for making those cats disappear while they still live there. But you guys feed your cats, your team or cats? Yeah, I have to carry over to Well, I'm going to capture that.
saying that beating is not the right thing to do? I mean, I'm, I'm saying sometimes it's not. Why? In what instance? I'll tell you a really great story about feeding. I had five cats. No, I didn't personally have them, but in my in Austin, there were five cats. They were having happy little cat lives, living in the backyards of ten houses, seven houses. And everybody was happy with the five cats because the five cats would just show up on their little onesie lives and people were feeding them. And then one of my feral cat people saw the cats and she started feeding the cats and she started feeding the cats. She couldn't go in those backyards to feed them because she didn't live there. So she started feeding them at the stop and go, the quick store, you know, I mean, the mini one. Mm -hmm. She started feeding them there. And so now all five cats are showing up at the same time, three days a day to get their food in the parking lot where they can get run over. And now the store owner says, you can't feed this cat. She those cats need to go away. This cat needs to get out of my parking lot, which then means the feral cat person to come get a meeting with me and is sitting in my office crying because she named them and she's feeding them three times a day and they can no longer stay in the neighborhood that they've been living in for years. So she went, knocked on all ten doors with people that were feeding them. They said, oh no, that's not my cat. I'm not going to take it. So she created that problem for cats that if she would have just quietly caught them, let us still love them, Put them back and let them go back to eating however they were eating. Those cats would have been happy in the neighborhood, and the neighborhood would still be happy with the cats. So we had to figure out what the heck to do with these cats that weren't nice I mean, they weren't tame. So that is a situation where feeding caused the problem in the neighborhood and caused the phone calls I was getting from that neighborhood was caused by feeding. Now, I had a grocery store that was on the front end road to a freeway. And those cats ate at a dumpster that was real close to the front end road, close to the parking lot. And so those cats were real pain because they were eating from the dumpster. So in that situation, we did send one of our TNR people to feed them every day in the woods that were right behind the HEV. So in that case, feeding caused the cats to go someplace else that was not a problem and it disappeared them. So feeding is a tool to help get to what you're trying to get to. And that's why I wanted us to talk about why, what are the, how do we evaluate solutions? Because nothing on the solution, on the evaluate solution says we're gonna make sure the cats have enough to eat. And this is really hard, this is a really hard topic for people that do TNR. Because they love their cats and they give them names and they call them Spotty and Freddy and stuff like that and they want to feed them. Yes, ma'am. Question of our TR program, we kind of revamped it last summer to include what we do is just make sure there's a caregiver, not one of us, but like what you said about the houses that we're feeding them. In our case, that would be that's okay because those people are dedicated to putting food out for those cats. And we um, know that they are, so we would tee it on them and back, but we wouldn't actively feed them. Well, I t I, and I've had many of these discussions, you guys don't throw things at me. But if we're going to let them be wild animals, let them be wild animals. Unless the feeding, unless the feeding solves the problem. The other thing that feeding does you know, is that it sucks the life out of your resources. Right? Because every 50 cats you spay and neuter, now somebody's going to feed those cats. And those somebodies are no longer trapping and transporting and, and fostering babies and all the other things. So, so I know what happens, and I've spent many, many hours talking with my TNR people in, in Austin, many, many hours. And um, we finally got to a place where we came to consensus that we would not feed where it caused a problem because in animal control that would be me would have to go pick those cats up and move them. And um, we could be at peace there. And then if they overextended themselves by feeding too much and not trapping enough, then I would just give them an the evil eye. That we're not focused on the prize here, and the prize is reducing the population. Okay. So anyway, what that's my lucky yeah, What if you use the community as your, like what I'm saying is the people in the houses are feeding them, those aren't your trapping people, it's the community. 
So we're providing the TNR, and we know that the community is taking care of the fee. I think that's fine. I just don't think it's a requirement. Right. Uh, well, personally, I just don't think feeding them is a requirement. And but I have never had anybody bring me a dead feral cat. And every feral cat that we track, ninety-nine percent of the feral cats that are trapped and sterilized are not starving. Right? They're eating raw food. That's the other thing. I feed my cats and my dog raw food that I make myself. And then I had these feral cat trappers that were feeding them pedigree. I'm like, they can just eat mice and have a much healthier diet than what you're feeding them. <coughs> so anyway, I just it's I think that feeding has to be viewed as a tool. And certainly if you have cats that are already being fed by a household and you're helping out with spay neuter, then that's great. Uh, what I think is a challenge and deplete your resources is when you say we're not going to TNR, if there's not somebody to care for them, then you're shutting down your own program and you're not keeping your eye on the prize, which is reducing the population. <coughs> so, I'm hearing that the solution to this could be that if you trap and bring to a clinic for spay and neuter a cat that appears to be in reasonably good health and you treat it, and you put it back, it's probably going to remain in reasonably good health. Yeah. Better because you've just sterilized it and vaccinated it. Yep. Yeah. So it gets eaten by a hawk or run over by a car or... Because it's been utilizing whatever resources are available in that community, whether it's a homeowner's food or the mouse population. Um, it's right. utilizing those resources and now it's going to continue yeah. to utilize those resources without reproducing it and yeah. stressing the resources. Right. And, and we didn't didn't really get to this, but the 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 big solution when we put an all cat is population <coughs> That's the deal, that's the target, that's the price. And these things are how we do that. So this is the root um, solution. The root problem is there's too many fear on the cats. The root and they're causing all these icky things to happen. And the root solution is population control. These are ways that we are going to improve how we're doing that. So if you buy this, if everybody in the room says, I adopt this as my mantra, and you start making your decisions around this, you'll make different decisions. Because this is what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to nice to them, name them, have families for them, and when we go off down little side trails, and, um, I think you have to do humane things. So if they come in and you're going to do TNR and they have an abscess, you need to make a decision about whether you're going to provide some antibiotics or whether you're going to euthanize them because you don't want to send it back and have this leg get going crazy and fall off. So you have to make some decisions about some of that stuff. I think we have to keep our eye on the prize. If we want to have um, a really effective TNR program. I was just going to um, bring up a, a, a point from uh, the, my own area that I live in, um, where people were talking about putting cats back out uh, that don't have, you know, a, a formal caregiver. Um, what happened uh, in where I live, which is you know suburban area here uh, in uh, Salem is um, I, because I'm active in my community, I know people throughout you know, several streets away, which a lot of people don't know. But anyway, there was, there was several stray cats. And sort of over the past year, suing conversations, find out that there's multiple people feeding these, these cats. Because one thing here in Salem is people do leave food out for both their cats and their dogs, and a lot of cats that used to be with dog food. So for people who are sort of hung up on this making sure the cat is fed situation, I can tell you just from my own area that not one of these cats uh, is going to go without, without food because there's so many people that leave food out for their own. The other, the other thought with feeding is that a colony, you have to maintain its sterilization status. And once you start feeding them, it just gets harder to track them because they're not excited about that food because they're getting so, so anyway, I don't mean to digress on that, but I think that in my opinion, feeding has to be looked at strategically as a tool to accomplish the goal 
and this is what the goal is, <clears throat> and not be looked at as some other thing that you're doing for other reasons. And that's really hard to swallow. It's really hard for, for cat people that are involved in touching these animals and bringing them in. It's hard to buy that book. Great. Let's go back to the fresh meat diet. <laughs> right. The estimates are out there from, from the Smithsonian Biological Institute. 1.4 billion to 3.7 billion birds killed by cats. In the so that fresh meat diet that sounds so innocuous, it sounds so healthy to cats, is really hard on a whole lot of native bird species. And the estimates for mammals is almost impossible to think, I think, about three times. So, True. these free roaming cats are having to take a lot of things. It's not just a matter of they're out there foraging benignly and fostering their own health through right. feeding fresh meat. True. But feeding them doesn't make them stop eating just fresh meat. All, all the birds that get killed in my neighborhood are by owned cats right. that are very well fed. <laughs> they just yeah. kill so, them anyway. So, the whole you know, this is this is my take on it. And I'm here to talk about your community as well. Is it's about population control. We cannot wind back the clock. There, there's no solution to wind back the clock and make all those cats get disappeared. So the best that we can do, in my professional experience, is to put programs in place that stop the pyramid from happening. And everybody's seen the pyramid where. So that's the best that we can do. And, and you know, they're, they're not going to die out. They're not going to, like, get disappeared because we've sterilized them. They're going to stay there until something eats them or whatever. And, um, and Ray and I talked about this a little bit. I'm a big believer in TNR for this reason. I read all the stuff about what they eat, what they don't eat, what they kill, what they don't kill, and all that. But at the end of the day, this is what I, I was responsible for doing, was controlling the population. And the most cost-effective way for me to do that was TNR. And the reason that was more cost-effective is a zillion people would volunteer to help me. We had 100 trappers in Austin. Wow. Um, if I called a meeting like this of just the trappers, 85 people would show up. And the other 15 didn't go to meetings. So that's good. You know, we said, here's these free resources. Go fetch me some cats. So if I said, here's some resources. We're going to use them as on these cats. No, nobody would be able to help And so at the end of the day, that's the end of the discussion when it comes down to um, should we try to disappear them out of the community or should we try to control the pyramid and make it not keep exploding? There's no way to disappear them. It's going to be cost effective. Well, I, I just want to add an emphasis that yes, the, the, the real solution is population control, but then we want to try to micromanage that. Like you said earlier, it's not an issue in these rural areas like the cat overpopulation because you have natural predators. But I look back east, this thing about the birds. I had a bird feeder out there and I had cardinals and morning doves. And every other day a, a hawk was coming in and picking off a morning dove. You know, I'm, so even if I love the birds, I mean, I, I just accept the fact that's that's nature, that's life, that that's what it is. Uh, and, and you know, getting back to Winnipeg, they have all these controls. Cats cannot be free roaming, and what you have is a secret deal because people start having mice problems in their yards, and they you, they get cats that get packs to say, "We let this cat, we let this cat roam and clean up our our alley." Mm -hmm. Um, in addressing the, the cat and the bird problem, um, I totally agree with you. We can't roll back the clock. And it, and I, I keep coming back to how we try to control coyotes. And if we, we're always going to have some cats in the area. And, and like with coyotes, if you wipe out all the coyotes in an area, in two or three years you have more coyotes than you wiped out two or three years ago because the resources expand and they look and it looks very inviting. So coyotes move into that area, have plenty of resources, have high litters, have high survival rates, and bam, you've got more coyotes than you started with. So <coughs> there's a combination of, um, in terms of, of working with the birds, population control on the cats so that they stop overpopulating an area, 
focusing the populations, like you're saying, if they're in the wrong place, focus them, be able to move the cats into areas, and, and doing some habitat <laughs> preservation for the birds. Um, we've impacted the bird population more than any single cat, so we don't have feral cat populations where the natural areas are supporting natural systems and a lot of diversity in the bird populations. So I think there's got to be, you know, there's so many aspects to this, and we can't just say that it's just the cats, but we can control the population, target them, and know that they're mostly <coughs> in areas where we have also massively impacted the bird diversity and, and numbers. And I uh, That's the conclusion I got to and I had my bird people, my cat people in the room like this for many hours together. The conclusion I got to was it didn't really matter because they're out there anyway and no one's going to go fetch them all up. There's not a vacuum cleaner to suck them all up and it someplace else. So let's get practical about it. And uh, in my opinion, what was practical was having a bunch of people that would work for me for free to go fetch them up so we can take it apart. Jay. Okay. Uh, just to kind of marry your idea with with Ray's about birds, you said that feeding is a tool, and I've, I've read studies that suggest that, you know, wildlife predation is higher where there is a feeding station. So if you're putting your feeding station in an area where they're not going to be catching a lot of wildlife and birds, you can also help, you yeah, know, so protect the wildlife. Well, what will happen with feeding stations <clears throat> is they will attract other animals. Yeah. Um, and those other animals are going to eat each other. And so, and I'll give you a really good example of this. I had um, some coyotes, and we had a coyote control, urban coyote control program, where we only eliminated an uh, alpha coyote that was encroaching into human spaces. So if it came on my deck to eat my cat, do I let outside, bring my dog? <laughs> then we considered that coyote a crop because it was willing to come into human space. But if it ate my dog out of the rebuild, my bad for the dog out there. So that's what we did. And so I had a neighborhood where I got some coyotes that were just out of control. And the whole family was camping out on the deck. <laughs> and and tracking that down, the biologist I work with, the wildlife biologist I work with found, and there's their scouts a hundred percent dog cat people. So then I had a meeting with my feral cat people and I had a feral cat trapper that was leaving big piles of food out for a colony that was in living in that green belt. <clears throat> And um, so I said, that's great. You're creating a cat buffet. <laughs> <laughs> so because it's going to draw the cats to one place, and the coyotes are just going to sit there and wait for cats and eat them up, and then eat their cat food too. So feeding, you know, the, when we mock in the world, whether it's with our bird feeders or our cat feeders or whatever, when we muck in the world, we're creating muckiness in world around us and my approach to TNR um, was to try to create the least possible amount of monkeyness in the environment and just accept that some humans, the fables or whoever screwed this up by letting cats run around and the best I can do is population control and be as hands off as possible to all the animals and um, it worked in my community. I didn't get complaints about the cats. Um, it worked in my community. So, we've really gotten off track from our solution. So, we were talking specifically about things that you would like to see change and things that we need to add or do or improve in Salem because we've now adopted this as the, as the prize, right? Like collectively tonight, we said this is the prize and we're all shooting the arrows at it. Have any other arrows that we need to be shooting at for addressing those five problems? And we just decided the root solution was population control. And when I check this up, it's going to be really groovy because I'm going to say root solution, population control. It's going to be really good. <laughs> other things that you'd like to see change here in Salem? Other programs you think we need to have? Or Improvements to your TNR program? Do you need to have more TNR? Yeah. Yeah. We don't have 100 trackers here. We can ask you if you say 
you want to have more TNR, do you need more money for the procedures? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you, need, and you need more trackers? More yes. More trackers? Yeah. And you need more um, volunteers to do kids socialization? Yes. Um, uh, foster homes? Yep. 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 And we need more doctors in too. to do another 200 and when that's done and then, okay. well you know so that's it <laughs> you know we're going from grant to grant you don't have anybody else doing it except for the van and, and the FCCO yeah. doing the so let's so talk about this cats we were doing from our partnerships as well as people just bringing them in and traps and it was a it was a fairly small percentage of all the of all the all cat the surgeries we did in what a year. What's your for now? 200? Well it was it was individual fundraisers last this week and it's going to be for 200 yeah okay and we just did about 120 so that'll be 320 okay and then we're getting more money in so I'm just not exactly sure how much. All I'm be. trying to get at is I think it would be useful out of our discussion to try to come up with a numeric goal for the community. Right. So in Austin, we were providing 3,500, either 3,000 or 3,500 free for 
free roaming cats, and then we provided, I don't know, like 10 or 12,000 a year of for loading, free low income. And then the two affordable clinics were providing around 30,000 a year. So you can get to an equation of per capita, for a million poor population, we were providing, let's say that number was 50,000 affordable surgeries. And then we could say that got us to uh, where we needed to be within take. So I think it's a good thing to, to say, here we are today in 2014, and we think we have for cats, you know, 800 a year free, and 1,000 a year low income. And what we'd like to be in two years is 5,000 total. I think that's a useful thing to do because it will help you see progress. And it helps you see, um, keep your eye on this. That um, if this number is going up, then it's measurable. And um, we can see progress towards getting this done. So anyway, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I suggested that's what I was trying to get at. We don't have to think what that number is, but I think we should be thinking about that right. as a follow-up discussion to have to roll for the next two to five years out of what we'd like to see the numbers become. Yes, ma'am? I know in my case, it's not a financial thing. I have taken care of a feral cat cold group in my neighborhood, and I have one that I can't stand here because the clinics aren't given often enough. I can't guarantee, I can make an appointment with the Humane Society for Wednesday. I can't guarantee I'm going to be able to catch that cat right. by then. I have one trap. I have four cats out there. I catch the same ones over and over. So I can't just stand up and I have to cancel it. The then by the time I catch the crap one, I call around and make an appointment somewhere. Feral Cat Coalition comes twice a month. So that means my cat has to sit in a cage for a week. I can't get in there and get it. I call Humane Society. They're booked for the next week. There's yeah, just not enough options. Yeah, private vets yeah. don't deal with yeah. it. We also do. We look at an article that's on the other one. Yeah, they do. That's not the issue. I've made some of those things. So I captured a crew. Yeah, I work with Crew of Haven, and Marcia says, call friends in Pee Line and give them our name. And I don't want to have to throw out. But you can help. You guys are having a discussion among yourselves. Offline. It's room free stuff, which is a different thing from a more capacity. Right? Yep. We could do 5,000 surgeries tomorrow, but that wouldn't solve that problem. Right? Okay. They yeah. based on the um, that. Improved access. You know, I want to capture access. Yep. That's a good point. Somebody in the grant writing business should write a grant to. Um, get the um, private vets to do something. They will.
So getting your, um, I don't want to forget something it is. Getting the public involved. Whether it's through accepting that it's a legitimate thing or whether it is actually getting them to start bringing in their cats um, will help you a lot. Okay, other solutions that you want to talk about? And if you don't have any more, I want to play the sticky dot game again. <laughs> Unless you just because I still want to get into um, some real specific things that you think are the biggest priorities that we could leave here tonight with, um, having some consensus about what direction we ought to go in beginning to get some of these solutions to come online. Does that sound like a good thing? So we could just go away with the whole list. But I'm not sure that what we do with all this. So, are you willing to play the docking? For those, just for the solutions. So, so question. Sure. Something that's not on there. Low income. You increase the low income standard for pet packs. Is that part of the solution? I mean, Target. It's, it's going to stop the flow of potential future feral cats. Is that? Yeah, that's true. They're old cats. They're old, yeah. but they're they're, they're not still sterilized. And more money for free. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So frequency, I think about 
ideally seven days a week, um, you can get a feral cat for free. Or access, I say, ideally, I don't have to drive to the other side of town because that's a pain in the butt. Make sense? Especially if you have five year old cats in the back of your car. Right? <laughs> okay. So is capacity falling under frequency then? But frequency isn't really there. Well, capacity, in my mind, what capacity means is if the Humane Society got a grant for $100,000 to do a zillion feral cats, do they have the capacity within their facility to do that? <laughs> So in Austin, the humane, the ASPCA gave us like $100,000. And I didn't have enough room in my shelter. I couldn't do my animals. I didn't have another table. I would have to give up doing my shelter animals. And the two nonprofits that do affordable, do low cost pay there for low income people, they didn't have enough table capacity. So the Humane Society did only because it was a Texas A&M training facility. And we got Texas A&M to agree that we could use their training facility to do feral cats. So that's what capacity meant to me. So capacity, access, and frequency, and dollars, those are the four things that you have to have to do more surgeries. So I didn't write down capacity because I thought that somebody said that's not a problem, that if you had more money, you could do more care. I guess. Eventually, you take it on the numbers yeah. and figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure yeah. Within this shelter, we have two veterinarians who can do it the next in six minutes, and two tables that yeah, yeah. are you know, and we just start to work with the budget funds to be able to do that. So, I think for now, I would leave capacity off of there. Um, now, if you get $100,000 next week, then you may say, Dang, we need another table, and then how to change it. But we can deal with that part of the iceberg when it comes up. What? Yeah, big problem though, then that was one of the That's so frequency. That's, that's a problem. We can address that with That's frequency. Yeah, yeah. That's a big problem. But that's, so when we vote, that was important, yeah. and you can vote on that one. That's frequency. So access is where? Frequency is. Let me just write it down. Right. Stop. And then, frequency is how long? Capacity really long. And dollars to dollars. Okay, so we're going to do this dot chaos quickly. So get your dots, or get your dots again. People, places. Um, oh. these, um, I hate 
circle all these. This one gives five. Thank you. 
So maybe something like that will happen here um, with this kind of log. So how does that ring to you as a way that you might proceed? And I didn't ask you that you like the Humane Society folks over here. I didn't ask you if they like this idea, just made it up. So <laughs> I want you to feel well, because some people work for a living and some people do this as they work for a living and they do this as a passion. And the people that work for a living have bosses. And they may not be able to say, yeah, that's a great idea, because their bosses would be able to do it. So I understand that. <laughs> I understand that um, you have bosses. The way I speak about that. And I am willing to facilitate the quarterly meetings, and I'm willing to do some work with the smaller groups if you find it's useful for the next few months or whatever. So if we do that, then what else would you like to see us discuss tonight? How do you prepare for that meeting? Because like maybe some people will have some input. Um, I'm sorry, I think I just said it. I just wanted to connect those two things because we do need to do this if we're going to do that. I'm sorry, can you say that again? How to prepare for the next meeting? What do they have in mind as we come to the next meeting? Well, I think how I would approach the next meeting, and this is what I would do, is uh, we need. We need to get on target. So somebody needs to start working on getting data that we can start using to say, let's go over here and do this. And that data is going to have to come from our shelter, where they're getting intake from, as well as our rescue groups, and whoever else knows where we're getting it. So what I'd like to see is if somebody maybe from the Humane Society can take the lead on data gathering, and I don't know if that's the appropriate entity. In, in, in Austin, I did it because we had the public, we had the open intake shelter, and we, and we had a bolo today. But um, we were the biggest gatherer of kittens. The so Humane Society shelter 3,000 animals a year, and I shelter 20,000 animals. So it made sense for us to get the data together. But if someone starts working on data, then this can start happening pretty immediately. If we start knowing where animals are coming from. And if this starts happening immediately, the our top two points for travel, you know, shelter intake and euthanasia rate, start going away. With just doing 300 cats in Austin, I reduced my euthanasia rate in one kitten season because they did the right cats. And I forget what the percentage points it was, but it was noticeable, like it went down 10% or 15% or 20%. It was a big number from doing 300 cats. They were the right cats. How did you find those right 300 cats? It's, here it's zip code is just too broad. That's what I was going to yeah, say. We, we, don't know that we, can, uh, we can plug in the addresses if everybody uses. We, uh, Jay can figure that out. Matt? Yeah, we, we could do uh, database searches. We have Chameleon as our database, and we could do um, database searches at a more finite level than um, zip code, combined with um, some of my trappers do. Uh, I mean, some of the trappers are the ones we miss kittens, but my intake people, like, you know, we get a zillion kittens from this trailer park. So I know, I know when we check in unowned intake, we check in the location found. And I don't know if there's a way to run a report pulling from that data field. I'm pretty sure there is. But I imagine there's some way. Intake, yeah, intake by operation extent. We may be able to run a report. You may have to put the word out to some of these people that are out there in the community. And, um, you may have to tell your intake staff, this is something we want to start knowing this kitten season. And they just start keeping track of it. My intake people knew when I 
said, what are my problem areas? And they can tell me this trailer park, this apartment complex. Yeah. The other thought I had is, is the field that I came out of is that have, you know, software, GIS software that will take <coughs> You're right, zip code doesn't buy me. What you really need is at least the street address or the intersection, <laughs> something of that sort. I know in the back, the city of Salem is big on GIS. They have, so I mean, one option could be to approach somebody from the city say, if we gave you, a, you know, some of these addresses, they, they could geocode that to you and then basically create a map that would show you, you know, what, the area of the city where it's coming from. Of course, I mean, just throwing that Yeah, out. And, and, and that's what, that's what we did. We had a couple of addresses and I just had to put a dot on that. Yeah. And then the map that would be up there, it was a solid presence. Yeah. But, but talking to people is important too because there's the dots on the map, but then there's something else when somebody says, we're getting a zillion kits from this trailer park. And I said somebody from now we're going to go to the trailer park and talk to the manager and the manager said, Yeah, this is the mother cat that don't make a catch. Anyway, there's dots on maps, but there's other kinds of information that's helpful. So that's something that if somebody can start working on, it would be good. Then um, the other thing that I think needs to happen in terms of collaboration, well the other thing I think needs to happen, and this is the beginning of collaboration, is I think the working group needs to develop a mission statement. And some of you that were here the last time I came, um, I have a sample one that I've done that um, gets specific and measurable and accountable. So I think that needs to be the next step for that working group. Then they do a whole lot of work. Work together. I think there needs to be a coalescing of the group into something more formal, with a formal mission statement about what they're doing. And I can come up with that. And when we get that done, we'll be bring it back to the bigger group so you can take a look at it. I can do it with all of you, but it takes a little bit of time, and that's not a very good way to get that done. But you'll like it. So that's what I think we had to do at the next meeting of that group, is get that mission statement boiled down. Because doing these things, these little projects, that's great, but we still need to have a focus on this. And this mission statement thing will give us a way to stay accountable. And it's not a mission statement that's like five pages long has a bunch of <laughs> word in it. It's a real specific thing. It says the purpose of the feral cat program. I'm not supposed to use that. Purpose free roaming catalyzer. The free, free of that is to do what? For what reason? And then you have measurements that you put underneath that that says, did you get that done? Um, I got my folks in Den um, do one, and they did name their Sterile Cat Program, although I'm beating them up every time I do it. So there says this, the purpose of the Feral Cat Program is to provide sterilization services to unowned cats in the Shoots County in order to reduce cat intake into animal shelters. Sterilization services are defined. We define what that is. It's a surgery, and rabies vaccination, and year to day. So once we wrote that down, that group is never again going to have a meeting and says, are we tipping ears or not tipping ears? Because that's what we decided. So that's what you get to with that, is you stop a lot of circular discussions about, are we going to give them rabies vaccinations? Are we going to give them FIB uh, vaccinations that have uh, initials? <laughs> <laughs>
how much does it cost for you to provide the services, and how many of them you provide. So I think if we do something like that, give that working group an accountable thing, makes it into a program, a, co a collaborative program, but it also brings something back to you guys to say, is this what you signed up for? And then if you did, you don't have any more discussions about <coughs> taking it or not taking it. I mean, you can have them if you But you see what I mean? It gets you focused and you stop spending your energy spinning around rehashing, rehashing stuff. Um, so we get that out of the way, and then we say, this is what we're all doing. This is the drum we're all marching to. And you'll be amazed how that clears the deck to move on with doing that, because you're not having a meeting every two weeks to talk about the same stuff over and over again, because now a different player comes in and has a different opinion. So that's what I would do with the next meeting of that group. Let's get that done. Then, um, in, in, the, in the meantime, um, while we're getting ready for that meeting, somebody should be getting started on this. And um, the shelter, how does the sheltering work here? Is the Humane Society contracted to be the open intake shelter? Well, no. just, for cats. just for cats. So we're not and we're not contracted. Oh, right. Who does your who does your open intake sheltering of animals in general? Well, we do. We're there's, the only resource no, for cats in Marion and yeah, County. Well, County. There is, uh, well, Marion County no has government. a dog control. Or, I mean, sorry, we're not <laughs> the only resource. Uh, but there's the only open admission resource for cats. So there's so, no contract. There's no, well, the only reason I was no. asking is that if there is some shelter that has a contract with the city to do sheltering, they know somebody in the city. The city doesn't do any of this. They do dogs only. Do they do anything? Dogs, dogs. 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 And none of us know them? Well, we know the dog people. Yeah. Well, knowing the dog people <laughs> is a way to find out who is the public health director. I can help somebody with this. Because I came from the city, I know how to do this. Okay. So um, we just, at this next meeting, so I think how we should proceed is the next meeting, let's get the missions thing worked out and get that working group really tightly put together. And then they'll be assigned these one, two, three, four, five, six things. And we can divvy up how we're going to go about doing that. Now, so is. Would that feel like enough progress? If we get the group together, we get the mission statement thing worked out, and then either in that meeting or the next meeting, because there may not be enough time in that meeting, but in the next meeting, then we sort out how we're going to tackle these things. Um, and then everybody would be happy if we came back and said we did that. And the other thing I want to talk about for just a second is that um, we need people to be in that group that want to do work and not just have opinions. Yeah. So if we don't have the right people in the group, even if we love those people, we should put those people out and get people to be in there that want to do work. Because we do need to have collaboration. And the, what collaboration is made up of is people do work. When I was running the shelter, I had like a million four people that told me what to do. But I had <laughs> ten who wanted to do it. Yeah. Me do it. Yeah. And so it can be overwhelming. And so the, the whole thing can be overwhelming. So we need to have a working group that can do work. And if we don't have the right people now, as much as we love them, and we love their passion and appreciate them, then we need to adjust the group before we get settled into the mission statement and get stuff going. So, do we have the right people? So, if we could take the people we have and clone them, you know, <laughs> we'd be in better shape. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, because everybody already is probably tapped out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in this room are probably already doing a lot, yeah. so it's trying to find time to do more, right? Right. Well, yeah. I tell you what, and somebody know if me remember this. Jay, somebody, are you making notes? Okay. 
So I think we should talk about that at the next working group meeting. Let's talk about what resources the working group needs. And do we have the right people in that group? And we can, and, and by that I don't mean individual people, I mean, do we need somebody that can work on the networking thing? And then if so, let's find that person. I think our group is well represented, in my opinion. In my strong opinion, they, I'm not talking, we have people that are good at communicating. We have the people that are working it. I think we're very well represented, in my strong opinion, what okay. I have experienced in four years. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Yes, ma'am? Everybody in the working group? Is that what you're suggesting? I thought the working group was going to be smaller. Yeah, it is. It is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They have a group They. I'm not sure. It's like six years old. There's there's a few people that are working together. What I'm suggesting is that will be the core group. Gotcha. To try to make headway on this. And then we'll report back to the bigger group, which hopefully gets bigger, on what kind of progress we're making and what we're doing related to these things. So if you think about this as our strategic plan, we're going to give the strategic plan to that working group that already exists. So the question I've been asking is, do we have the right people in that group? Because I don't know who they are. And, um, but I think we can just talk about that in the group and see if we need to plug any holes or fill any gaps with um, other resources. We can talk about that. So at the next meeting, we should um, talk about whether we've got the right working group, and then if we do, we get on with the mission statement. If we don't, we can decide whether we want but maybe not. Maybe we should just do the mission statement where we need to join the group and just raise our hand and say, I do. <laughs> okay, so if we go off and do those things. Um, and do you guys feel like this was time well spent? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, the other thing we want to make sure we have in the follow up items is that we'll commit to quarterly meetings like this. A lot. Are you guys willing to commit to that? I think they'd be shorter. It was a huge thing for me in Austin when I started having those quarterly things. It was a huge thing. And at first it was a lot of eating. Because you know, cat people, they don't like the box of anybody except for the cat people, and especially, you know, I was in charge of animal control and animal cruelty, which was, you know, seizing cats from hoarding situations. And so there was a lot of distrust. And uh, you know, people want to grow for what they wanted to be a part of it. I'm not sure what's going on. But once I had this quarterly meeting, everybody started getting in the room together. That really fit into more people getting involved. I mean, when we first started, it was this many people on this side of the room, and you know, two years later, I had you know 80 people in the room with me. So I think the quarterly meetings will help you grow enthusiasm and excitement about what you're doing. Okay, then I'm feeling done. Y'all are feeling done. <laughs> Is there any final remarks anyone would like to make? Everybody can say everything you want to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for being here. here. Yeah. Thank you. Is everybody get their email on the list? Yeah, is there any housekeeping or anything else, Jay? Is everybody got on the list? Yeah. Um, and we will be sending the, the minutes of this meeting. We, we invite you to invite your friends. Get the word out about what's going on and how we can make this grow. So, and we'll, we'll keep in touch. If you came here and this is your first time, you'll be hearing from us. We're so grateful that you came. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank you so much.